Welcome to the Sheets on Top podcast. This is a place where we talk to inspiring women and share their stories. Hi, I'm Jessica. And I'm Tracy, and we are your hosts. What does it mean to be a woman in today's world? What does success look like? What does it feel like? Is there one definition? We talk to women entrepreneurs and change makers about their ups and downs, their triumphs and failures, and how they define success. We believe every woman has a unique value and a story worth telling, and it's our great joy to share these stories with you. Today, we are thrilled to bring you our conversation with Robin Kovitz. Robin is the president and CEO of Baskets, Inc., one of Canada's fastest growing companies. Baskets designs, manufactures, and delivers beautiful gift baskets across Canada and the U.S. Before acquiring Baskets, Robin worked in private equity, buying and selling mid-sized companies. She has an MBA degree from the Harvard Business School and a BCom degree from Queen's University. And in 2017, she was recognized as a Canada's most powerful woman, top 100 award winner. Needless to say, Robin's background is impressive, but what inspired us is that she is intentional about leading with kindness. She believes that you can be successful by leading with the heart and having a more feminine approach to business. This interview really made us rethink kindness and our impact on others. It is so in line with She's on Top's core beliefs. We really hope you enjoy this conversation as much as we did. Here's our chat with Robin Kovitz. Hi, Robin. How are you? I'm great. Thanks, Jess. How are you? Perfect. Well, we thought the best thing would be to start off. If, just tell us a bit about Baskets, like what the company is, what you do. Sure. So I hope some of the listeners have heard of us. Uh, we're Canada's <laughs> largest gift service company. And so we design, manufacture, um, market, sell, deliver gift baskets and boxes all across Canada and the U.S. Uh, the company has been around for over 35 years. I purchased it six years ago, and it's really just a lot of fun. We make beautiful things that make people happy. You really do. I think I've used your basket company before, and you make beautiful things. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, <laughs> my question to you is, why did you buy a company rather than start from scratch? What was the thought process behind that? Great question. Um, so I think the data is pretty clear that starting a business is difficult. Um, the vast majority of businesses started fail, and, and often like within their first or second year. Um, and so I wasn't that brave. <laughs> there are so many great examples um, of people who do a great job on it. Um, but I think, no, that combined with the fact that a lot of my experience prior to buying baskets was in mergers and acquisitions and private equity investment, um, that I felt it would be more natural to buy something a little bit larger, um, you know, replace that salary I was used to earning on Bay Street, and then jump into running a business rather than starting doing everything from scratch. Uh, it makes sense. Well, we definitely want to talk about your background because it's such a fascinating shift. But before we go there, I've been curious, been thinking, why baskets? Why did she buy baskets? Like how many companies did you look at before you 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 decided? Ooh, thousands. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And, and to be honest, when when baskets, the concept of buying a gift basket company first came across my desk, I said, pass. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I said, not interested. I didn't think there was a competitive advantage. I didn't think it met my investment criteria. I, I said, oh, you know, fun as a hobby, but I, I didn't see it as a business. And then as I dug into it, I saw that there was a lot of opportunity. And so, um, you know, it's like, like finding a life partner, right? You, you get your, your list. He, he or she has got to be tall and smart and, you know, whatever else. <laughs> and so I like finding a business. It's very similar to the dating pipeline, the deal pipeline. And I, you know, established my list and then I whittled it down. And then I reminded myself, I probably only get three. Um, and so I had this list, you know, like recurring cash flow, good customer base, limited customer concentration, certain things that I was looking for. Uh, and baskets ultimately ended up meeting all of those. But most importantly, I think something that's a little bit different about me than, than most people who do sort of entrepreneurship through acquisition is that I went uh, with my heart. Um, so there were many businesses that not many, but there were a few where I got close to buying them that met my, you know, investment, boring investment criteria, where I knew I could be successful in buying it, sort of building it up and selling it. Um, but this one is like, we, we call it my third child. Uh, there's just something so special about this business. Our customers are the most thoughtful, kind people in the world. You know, it's the selfless act of giving to their friends, family, employees, customers, prospects. 
Um, and it's just, there's something really beautiful. I think I told you before, when I'm having a bad day, I just read all of our card messages and it's, you know, <laughs> thousands of people from all over the world sending people in North America their best wishes. And I really just fell in love with this business and thought that I could uh, help make it even better. Lovely. That, yeah, that's absolutely beautiful. You talk about going with your heart. So before this, you were working as an investment banker, right? And so going, so how was that transition, investment banking, to going to a business that you're leading with your heart? <laughs> yeah, that, that does sound stark, yeah. doesn't it? <laughs> it really does. <laughs> Um, so there was a little journey along the way. So I was, I worked in mergers and acquisitions after my BCom. Uh, I did that for many years and I really enjoyed learning really the sell side, how to sell a business, uh, how to help clients sell their business, really on the advisory side. Um, and then I went, I was lucky enough to go to the Harvard Business School, which was a dream for me since I was a little, little kid. Um, and there I was exposed to mostly guys uh, who were in private equity and I wasn't that aware of that career path. And so they were more on the buy side, um, buying businesses on behalf of a fund that they had raised capital for. And I thought, this is so interesting. Um, I, I grew up with a family business. So these guys really thought operationally, like my father and my grandfather, you know, about the nuts and bolts of running a company, but were sophisticated, like the Bay Street investment bankers I had studied and worked with for years in the fact that they could, you know, really look at a capital structure and, and a balance sheet and, and, and figure out well, what was happening with the company. And so I just thought, and when I was at Harvard, that working in private equity it would be a dream. I came back to Canada and was really lucky to do that um, and sort of got really lucky, uh, joined an up-and-coming fund, bought with them, sort of apprenticing, bought three companies really quickly and learned from them all along the way. Um, and then when I turned 30 and started having kids, I decided I wanted to try and buy a small business on my own. Um, and so I had had that experience on the sell side and investment banking on the small buy side uh, through private equity. And I decided to, so while it sounds stark, it was a bit of a path. <laughs> it's so interesting to listen to you because, you know, the early part of your career, like you said in your background, that it was your father and your grandfather who were entrepreneurs. So that's a strong male influence. And then you went into the corporate world, which, you know, is, you know, not to be stereotypical, but it's much more, it's kind of a, I think, a, a masculine archetype of terms of, you know, profit sales, all that kind of stuff. But you're this part of your life now when you had children, you're now embracing the feminine. Can you talk a little bit about that, embracing the feminine in your business or? Sure. I love, this is why I love speaking with women. I've never been asked that question before. They're very, <laughs> very interesting and smart. Um, yeah. I mean, I think a few things. Firstly, yeah, I grew up with, I was so, very fortunate to grow up with the influence of my father and grandfather who were entrepreneurs, reluctant entrepreneurs. Um, and, but I also why reluctant? had, why reluctant? Sorry to stop you there. Just curious. Before we... Sure. They both had other careers. So my, my dad was an architect oh, my. and my grandfather was a dentist and they just sort of not fell into it, but it ended up becoming uh, their livelihood, which is kind of neat. Uh, and actually what I, I, I try to learn something from everything. What I learned from that was that, um, you know, they really brought their disciplines, what they learned um, in their other careers, their business. So for example, my dad was a brilliant architect and in architecture, you really learn about problem seeking and problem solving. And he applied that sort of creative problem solving to the lens of um, uh, meat manufacturing, which was the business that he was in. And he actually has a patent. Like he developed the prime rib burger, which is like, mm, you know, very cool. who would have thought of <laughs> making a hamburger with a different type of material? It seems very <laughs> common now, but 30 years ago, it wasn't. So um, but I, I was very lucky too, to grow up with the influence of my grandmother, who was a real pioneer. Um, and I'm really sad to share that she just passed away this week um, oh, at 95. Oh, wow. Thanks. But she was, um, she was an incredible, so she was a stay at home mom who was sort of a community activator, who was one of the first women on some of the corporate boards in Canada who advised prime ministers who oh, wow. ended up with an order of Canada. Uh, wow. What's, your, what's who, your grandmother's name? So we can look her up. <laughs> sure. She, she's got a Wikipedia page. Her name is uh, Muriel Kovitz. Uh, oh, great. And uh, she was just incredible, but she, but she was first and foremost, always my grandmother with that real feminine, you know, we'd go to her house and she'd have made a whole dinner. And, and, uh, and so I just feel very lucky um, that I grew up with that influence. She was clearly a pioneer in the seventies. That wasn't commonplace. Um, to see that you, you could be both. You, you absolutely could be both. Um, and I think that I'm grateful for that. I think, you know, this next generation, they see it. Uh, but back when we were growing up, you know, it wasn't so common to see that, you know, you can be a mom and have a business or a career or 
Yeah, I think sometimes too, it's seen as a, as a sign of weakness in a way to like lead with the feminine. Mm-hmm. And so have you come across that? Like, in, in, can you give us examples of when you've led with a feminine and you've come across resistance? Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because for the start of my first career, um, kind of like Jessica was implying, you, you sort of, especially when you're young, I think you try, mm-hmm. um, you try to almost be like the people around you. So, you know, you try to be for me, it was less feminine because there weren't many women in the boardroom uh, that I was in in investment banking. Um, but then, as I've become older and uh, and more confident, I really have learned that being leading with that feminine, almost maternalistic uh, lens is actually extremely powerful. Um, and there's actually there's actually a male business leader who I follow called Bob Chapman, who is just remarkable. And he, and he sort of takes the lens that every one of our employees is is you know someone's son or daughter in our care. And, you know, if you want, if you need to have a conversation with an employee about, you know, not like performance, not going well, imagine how you would have that conversation with your son. And I think it's a very powerful lens and I'm, I'm still learning and growing as a leader. I was not a strong CEO when I first started out seven years ago. I'm, I work with coaches that every day I try and get better. I actively solicit feedback, but I, I think, I think there's something very, very powerful. So in the beginning of my career, it was sort of, yeah, I think it was sort of frowned upon and I almost tried to be more masculine. Um, but now I'm seeing as sort of the matriarch of this business that it's actually, I think people want to work somewhere that cares about them. It Absolutely. makes sense. It's so interesting. You said, you know, when you first started at Baskets, you were not a good CEO and you've reached out to coaches. So what have you learned over the seven years? What's made you a better CEO? Oh my God. I'm still learning so much. Um, I mean, I, I took over a, a, a declining business, um, where the founders hadn't spoken to each other in years. Um, with sort of lack of morale and it was, it was a big challenge. Um, and I was very young um, and I'd come from investment banking. I mean, I, I'll, I'm grateful for that experience. Um, but I remember, you know, actively seeking out performance feedback when I was on Bay street and, and my boss who I loved said to me, Robin, you get, you get feedback once a year and it's a number. Wow, <laughs> like there's well, no actionable yeah, yeah. description, so true, isn't it? Yeah. 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 And I said, Oh, yeah, no, thank you for my bonus, but how can I be better? <laughs> and, he, and he was like, no, that's just not how, how the culture is. Um, and so I've just, I think I've always naturally been a person who wanted to be better. And I think, you know, when I first became a CEO, I think I had um, unreasonable standards of what uh, the level of performance that would sort of taking the Bay Street um, mindset and thinking it was on Main Street. And I think that um, it's getting a bit better on Bay Street, but I think the expectations are, you know, they, the expectations are that you work evenings, weekends all the time. And that's just what you have to do to have a seat um, at some of these firms. I think it is changing. Um, but I think, um, I think I, I learned that people are people and, and we all have what I say now gifts and gaps. And the key to being a successful CEO is, is nurturing those gifts and making sure that the team is sort of like a quilt that uh, makes up for some of the gaps um, and, uh, just really being patient. I think actually becoming a mother has helped me a lot too. Um, because I wasn't very flexible or patient before I had kids and, you know, the way (laughs) you explain things to your kids and you explain it again, and then you ask them why it didn't happen. Um, you know, that's the sort of mindset that I try to take with my employees instead of being angry that something wasn't done. I try to understand why and how I can support. When we first connected with you, um, I was so impressed with some of the things that you have implemented. Um, especially during COVID. And I know like, you know, you probably don't want to toot your own horn, but I would love our listeners to uh, to hear about some of the amazing things you've done in your company. So could you share that with them? Because you're so successful and people might think, oh, by doing this, you know, it will affect our profits, it'll affect our bottom line, but it hasn't. So I'd love to you, for you to share some of those examples. Oh, thanks, Tracy. Well, first, I just wanted to say, I didn't get a chance to say that I, I so admire and appreciate and respect the community you guys have built for other women. And, and uh, well, it may seem successful now, it's certainly, you know, no p- career path is a straight line. And I certainly, you know, when I was 20 and starting out, still uh, sought resources like this to help me figure things out or find the next path or become inspired. And so I just love um, Thank that you. you guys are doing that <laughs> for this generation. <laughs> and frankly, I'm like, kind of pinching myself that I get to be on the stage because I've, I've listened to some of these. So thank you for, for having me and for saying that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just, this more, the more I embrace this feminine side and lead from the heart and do what I think is right. Uh, the more it sort of becomes a snowball. Um, it's interesting because in the beginning, I think you, you, we can be scared to, to lead that way. Um, so for example, um, 
uh, when, when COVID first hit, unfortunately, we had a manager who was very affected uh, and sort of needed to leave, to take a personal leave to to deal with mental health. And, and um, you know, it was very scary for us all. And, and so I jumped in and started leading that team. And that team um, was remote. Um, and so I was sort of racking my head, what can I do? And, and there were even new team members who I'd never met in person before. How can I make this team feel like we're having coffee together at the office when we've actually never met? Um, and so again, kind of borrowing from my motherhood experience, we came up with this system called traffic lights where every morning we hold up a sign, uh, and we say what color we are across the zoom. And so, and it's just sort of uh, a way to connect a way to make sure we're aware and respectful of what else is going on in other people's lives, a way to show that the manager or leader cares about workloads and, and, uh, that person, uh, we even have a blue color. So, uh, which means like, I'm just sad, right? Maybe my boyfriend dumped oh. me or, oh, uh, and wow. I'm going to need to lean on you guys today. Cause I'm not at my best personally. Um, and I think bringing that sort of humanity into our team and, and it's almost weird in a way that COVID led to it, um, has made us connect on a level and operate on a level that is unimaginable. Uh, we're such a strong team, uh, really so synergistic sharing. We do these little knowledge flashes in the morning on our huddle, um, where we share things that we've learned with the rest of the team. Um, so really kind of move the company from a culture of, you know, Hey, shame on you, Tracy. Why didn't you get that done? Or Jessica, I can't believe you didn't know that to, Oh, you didn't know that. Let me show you what I just discovered. Now do you want to walk through it and I'll help you get there. Um, just a really loving, nurturing environment and, and people are thriving. Are you a woman entrepreneur looking to grow your business? Would you benefit from being connected with a highly engaged group of women entrepreneurs invested in your success? Then we'd love you to join our community. Here you can collaborate, network, cross-promote, and feel supported, whether it's a free expert workshop or one of our fun events like our monthly hikes. You can find all the details on membership in the notes, or you can go to our website at she'sontop.com. You know, it's funny because it... it you know, it all seems to go back to vulnerability. And we've heard so many people talking about this, obviously, you know, the pioneers, um, Brene Brown, but there's I even was even listening to podcasts from Simon Sinek. And most of the, what I consider uh, leaders in business are, thought, are talking about this, that the only way forward is to do what you're doing. So the fact that you have figured it out, it's like you're way ahead of the game. How is it affecting you personally in your life? Like, how does it affect you to lead this way as opposed to the way that, that you were working before? It feels much better. It feels more authentic. Like that's a, yeah, I love Brene Brown and Simon Sinek. Um, I think, and it's also just, just focusing on the positive. I know it sounds so simple, but I mean, you know, as a small business owner, every day things happen. I I drive to work every day saying, I wonder what's going to happen today. And I deal with the craziest, strangest situations. Um, and if I truly, if I focus on all of those, it, it would destroy a person. There's just so much negative that you could choose. And so every day, actually my grandmother taught me this, I choose happy and I choose to focus on the things that are good and that I want. And, uh, it, it just snowballs from there. Um, I wanted to come back to Tracy, your question about, um, about things that we've implemented. I think one lesson I've learned, and I, by all means don't have all the answers, but that I wanted to share with people is, um, really looking at investment versus cost. Um, so for example, and I, it's so difficult to judge any other business because you have no idea what's going on, but I know, you know, just as I was watching sort of other businesses and, and the number of COVID outbreaks that they were having in their factories or environments, we early on, and we, we had the luxury of being able to do this given we are successful financially and small said, you know what, if you if anyone in your household is even sick or if they've been exposed to someone or they have anything even like remote, a sniffle, stay home and we will pay you. Don't come in. Wow. Wow. Amazing. And, um, and we did that from the start and, and we, we've paid a lot over the last 15 months of just people staying off at home. Um, just because, because they were scared. Uh, but the result was we haven't had a single case touch wood in our facility. Um, and I think people really feel cared for, uh, there's been a lot more cross training in our company. Um, and so I think it would be very, there have been so many benefits, uh, intangible benefits, I think, that ultimately led to more financial results, that it would have been a mistake to say that's too expensive to do that. Um, yeah, I find that's, that's so interesting because, you know, I don't want to get too political, but you look at the Ontario government, which, you know, doesn't imp- implement sick leave. Um, and I think what it comes down to is an old model, an old um, 
maybe male model that profit comes first and people come second. So you are highly successful. I think in 2020, the Global Mail, you were one of the leading businesses. Do you find leading this way has affected your bottom line? Like some businesses might say, well, that's good for you, but we can't afford to do that. Can every business afford to do this? Mm, it's such a hard question. And I have like, people ask me all the time about politics and who I support. And I, I always say I support everyone who's in government because it's mm-hmm. such a difficult job. And I, I can't imagine I have so much empathy for anyone who chooses service. Um, um, I, I don't know. Like I think about, I see both sides, right? Of course, sick leave is, is essential. At the same time, can you imagine that every restaurant had to offer that for all their part-time employees? Like it would be, you know, those businesses on the edge, I don't know how they could survive. Um, and so I just, I, my heart bleeds because these problems are so complex. And, uh, and I almost feel like sometimes our leaders, um, elected leaders, like they can't win regardless of how they solve it. Um, but I, I am hopeful that there will be in the future sort of more collaboration with business and some of the think tanks in our country to figure out hybrid models that could support it. Because ultimately, uh, it just posted on my Instagram, I, I really believe that in that Gandhi quote that any society is, is judged by how it treats its least vulnerable. Um, and to get political, I guess I would say it has been interested to see the change in that in the U.S. over the last 30 years. Yeah, it's so true, isn't it? It, it was funny. I was listening to what you were saying too. And I was thinking about how you define cost, right? Because you actually have the idea of, okay, it's going to cost me to pay this person sick leave, but what's the big cost? Like you said, if everybody had gotten COVID or it's going to cost me to, you know, maybe somebody wants to work four days a week, but um, I, I'd be so curious to find the results for you because it seems more and more people are, they used to think it, we wouldn't let people work at home for an example, because it wouldn't be cost effective. And we're finding out that's not true. What have you found cost wise from some of these things you've implemented? Yeah, I think that's just so astute, Jess. I think um, it's it's really, and then I guess, does it come down to time frame that you measure these things? So for example, I'll give you another example in our business. Um, you know, Tracy sends you a basket. It's really important to her. Uh, we send it UPS. So out of our hands, but technically our responsibility, they lose it. Tracy's livid. That happens in our business rampantly. And our competitors would say, sorry, file a claim with UPS. I don't think that's good enough. Um, so I guess the theme I'm trying to say is, is we try to do the right thing. I say, I, I took Tracy's money. I have an obligation to get that basket to Jessica. Yes, UPS made a mistake, but that's on me. I contracted with them. I'll deal with them. Otherwise, I'm going to immediately send you a new one. No questions asked for free. When people join our, our company, they are shocked by that. Say, how can that make any business sense? Our competitors don't do it. We send thousands of baskets for free every year when situations like that arise. Uh, it's not that common. We send hundreds of thousands of gifts a year. Um, but for me, when you, I just think it's difficult to analyze the, co- the short-term cost of something that's doing the right thing. Because you know what? If we hadn't replaced that basket, Tracy, you would be telling all your friends how horrible we are. You'd never use us again. And then we surprised you and did the right thing, which nobody does anymore, especially in customer service. And guess what? You're probably going to tell five people how amazing we are. And all we did was what we contracted to do. So can you measure that? I don't know, but I, I, that's how I lead and that's how we operate as a company. And, and so is the success coming from that? Is it coming from, you know, the planning we've done or is it luck? I don't know, but I do think the more we do the right thing, the more people like-minded people we attract and the more our success grows. It's so funny. I love that because my mom, um, I grew up with my mom. She was an entrepreneur and she had a very well-known stationery and card store in Toronto. And I learned early mm-hmm. from her, one of the things that she did that I thought, I, I thought was the norm, she would take anything back, anything anybody brought back, whether it was a card or whatever. And her feeling was they're back in the store. And she said, nine out of 10 times, they will come back and they'll return a card and they'll walk out with, you know, three photo albums <laughs> and <laughs> things. So, and, and they keep coming back. And I always held that. And I thought it's that whole thing about you know, like just like looking at the bottom line or the moment, this cost versus the big picture gain. So I love, I love that. It's a great way to think. But it, but it is a luxury too, like you said. Um, and when I was first starting out and we were much smaller and, you know, access to capital, um, like bank debt or equity investment for entrepreneurs, particularly women entrepreneurs in Canada is, is difficult. And it's something uh, I think a lot of people are trying to work to improve. Um, it was hard because when, when, when every penny literally counts and you're at that stage, which we were for a very long time, um, it's, it is hard to see the forest through the trees, but you just have to have faith 
that what you're doing is the right thing and that it will, will pay off. Yeah. I think what you're also saying is that you're being true to yourself, that you're being authentic and you're being your authentic self in your business, which I think is incredible. I think when you are your authentic self, you are successful. But have you have you had any pushback from either employees within your organization or or maybe suppliers? Have you had any pushback in the way that you're leading from your authentic self? Yeah, I think um, anytime you you buy a, a long term company and then make a lot of changes, there's there's always challenges, and and uh, I expected that. I didn't quite expect it to be as difficult as it has been. Um, you know, like in the day we we uh, we didn't really have a proper computer system, or we didn't send purchase orders. We sent them by a fax, or sometimes we did, we forgot to send them at all. And you know, I've put in a very sophisticated uh, tech backbone, some of it proprietary, which has facilitated some of our success. And I think that's really difficult for a lot of people, right? Um, and I think sometimes the pace at which I change or move uh, can be intimidating or confusing or unsettling. And it's taken me a long time working with a coach to understand that. Um, and you know, it's it's interesting. There's a uh, one of my coaches has taught me, you know, there's that golden expression, you know, like my, my son in grade two says, you know, treat other people like you want to be treated. But I've actually learned as a CEO, it's the opposite. Um, you don't, you don't treat them how they want to be treated. Um, mm. Because if you, you probably don't want to be treated the way I want to be treated. <laughs> <laughs> and so while I love that for little kids, I think as a leader, it's really important to understand, okay, what motivates Jessica and what is her working style and, and what would she want, right? Maybe it's way more important to you that you le- are able to leave at three o'clock every day for something um, than it is to earn more money uh, or, you know, whatever your personal thing is. And it's so as a leader, really understanding um, how each person wants to be treated and then trying to adapt your style and being conscious enough to do that to me is, is what I'm working on every day. I don't have it figured out yet. <laughs> so smart. And it, it's, we, we love the fact that we we see this with so many strong female leaders. We were interviewing um, Emily Chang last week and she described herself, her, her leading style. She's the CEO of McCann World Group China. And she described herself as caring assertive. And she said, if you're just caring, you can look like you have a lack of clarity where, and I'm wondering for you, how do you, we see, see all this amazing stuff you do. How do you strike that balance for when mm-hmm. you just have to say, sorry, it's not, not good enough. You're out of here. Like, how do you met, do that? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's a great question. And I'm still trying to find that balance. Uh, and I think because I'm young and I speak quickly and I love fashion, I think I can be underestimated too. And so mm-hmm. it is, you know, something I'm working on with my own, own style. Um, I think, and it, and I think it all comes down to boundaries too. Right. Um, so I think, um, it's funny when I first started down this path of compassionate leadership, um, or truly human leadership, uh, my husband said like, but I don't get it. Like your standards are so high. And I think a lot of people see that as being mutually exclusive. Like if you're caring, you can't be successful. Um, and I, I actually think it's the opposite. So our standards um, at Baskets are extremely high. We have a high performance meritocracy. Um, it's taken us six years to recruit and build a team that operates at that very, very high level. But it doesn't mean we're not nice to each other and don't care about each other. Um, so again, it's that lens of, okay, Tracy's really struggling. How can we rally as a team to help her? How can we analyze what, why she's not being successful? Is she in the wrong seat? Does she need more support? Does she need training? Is this really not the right place for her? And we can help her find somewhere that is for her. Um, I always say life is too short to be unhappy. And we spend way too much time at our work to, if you don't, if you don't like revere and like want to be your boss, then you need to find another job because, um, life is too short. It's so true. You know, we talk about success a lot and all the women that we interview, uh, we always discuss this with them. Like, what does success mean to you? I love that question. Um, that was actually one of the questions on my Harvard Business School application 15 <laughs> years ago. And I was just a youngin. And I actually went and interviewed my grandmother and anyone else that I respected because I was like, what does it mean? Like, that is such an intense question. Um, and I want to hear your answers too, but I was so shocked. You know, is it, and I actually had this conversation with my 10 year old daughter last week. You know, is she said, who's the most successful person in your graduating class? And I said, well, what, what is success? And she said, I said, is it money? Is it power? Is it the number of lives that they've influenced? Is it, you know, and I could just see her little 10 year old face scrunching up being like, that is, that is complicated. <laughs> um, so it's, I'm, I'm, I love that you asked that question. Cause I, it's something I think about all the time and it's, it's a definition for me that's really evolving. Um, and I think where I've gotten to now it's, it's life's touched. 
Uh, and I think that's part of why I love baskets so much. Um, to me, it's, it's, I have this incredible privilege of having, you know, 40 full time up to over a hundred seasonally employees in my care and my charge. Um, and I want to help each and every one of them be better and be happier, uh, all the way down to our suppliers. I I'm a weird a uh, customer who really believes suppliers need to make money too. Of course, we'll always ask for their best price, but there's a lot of, especially in, in corporate Canada, there's a lot of people who just want to push and push their suppliers. I don't believe in that. Um, and so I just want to, you know, I want, I love nothing more than there's this one woman owned business in Strathmore, Alberta. And I met her at a trade show and she was young and slogging her samples. And, you know, we gave her like a $300,000 PO and I knew it would change her whole business. Um, <laughs> so to me, success is defined by the ha- positively impacting life's touched, whether it's suppliers, customers, vendors, uh, employees, um, and my own kids too. I think one thing I'm, you know, I've given so much to baskets over the l- last seven years, over the next seven years, you know, the dream was always to, you know, take a summer off and travel with them. And so, um, yeah, that's how I would define success Beautiful. at 41. That's amazing. <laughs> well, yeah, I was going to say, like, I, I, I can just jump in. Has it changed since you were at Harvard? Like, has your answer changed? Yeah, huge. I mean, when I first wrote my application, I was struggling. When I, when I first, like, my very first instinct was money. Like, success yes. is money, right? Like, the most successful people make the most money. But then I started thinking about it. That it's, it's so much more than that, right? Uh, what if you made all the money in the world and you didn't have your, your health? So it's health. Is success health? I don't know. Like, you know, you just go through this decision tree of what it is and what it isn't. Um, but coming back to this Brene Brown authentic sort of style, finding what it means to you and your heart. And for me, it's like, it's almost, you know, the definition for me is evolving to peace. Like to me, feeling peace, like going to bed at night and not feeling guilty, not feeling, uh, just knowing that you've done the best you could. And, uh, that was another mantra of my grandmother's that's success to me, uh, regardless of the money that you make or the impact you have. Uh, but for me, yeah, the more, the more people I help, the better I feel. I love that. It's so funny because um, Michelle Cooper is another woman in our group and she's uh, does finance for entrepreneurs and she did a lunch and learn recently. And she said, anybody who says money can't buy happiness, hasn't made enough and hasn't given enough away. <laughs> and, you know, th- I love that you said that, you know, that, and so I think what they mean is people always assume it's like money can't buy happiness as far as houses and cars, but for, she had a passion about the ocean and helping the ocean. So it's like, it's again, these, these terms, it's all your perspective on, on how you deal with this. You know, you've mentioned your grandmother a lot. Is there any other woman who really influenced you or was it, was it her? Oh my goodness. Yeah. I mean, my mother is incredible. She's brilliant. A stay at home mom who was always there for us. She's still my biggest supporter, confidant, best friend. Um, along the way, uh, I've, I've had the privilege of having many sort of business mentors. Uh, Sheila O'Brien is one. She was one of the most uh, powerful, what probably still is, a woman in the oil patch. Uh, and she, I'll never forget, she invited me to her office when I was quite young and I got to do a day in the life and followed her around. And I just was like, this is great. Like someone <laughs> like fills her car up with gas. And I was like, this is the dream. <laughs> um, um, no, but I mean, so many women have been kind to me along the way. And I, I try to learn from everyone. Um, coming back to that point about touching lives, this is something I've struggled with. And only now, I think in my 40s, have the confidence that, for example, I like to overpay people. So like our housekeeper or our nanny or, you know, someone like like that who works really hard or a waitress or who works really hard, does the best they can, they're trying. Um, I love to surprise them with an exorbitant bonus or tip or... Um, And to me, that's better than, you know, watching every penny to make sure you maximize profit and then giving it away to charity to name some building after yourself. To me, that's true philanthropy. Um, A daily practice is what you're telling us, right? Yeah. 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 I, I just, I just love what you're saying so much. I love that you lead from the heart that you lead with the feminine. And I've actually learned so much from you today. Um, it's an honor to talk with you. I hope we can continue this conversation and come back and revisit you, you know, and see how things are going with baskets. But Robin, thank you so much. This has just been fantastic. It's so great. You're incredibly inspiring. You, you're doing something that Tracy and I are, are, are hoping to do too, which is, you know, so thank you for this. Cause it's, uh, it's been a real boost. Thanks for having me. I've loved chatting with you too. If you enjoyed this podcast, we'd be grateful if you take a moment to rate it and write a quick review because that helps us get found. And of course, we'd love it if you subscribe. 
To learn more about us and our amazing community, go to our website and sign up for our newsletter. And you can also follow us on Instagram at she's period on period top. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.